The other area I want to emphasize is the digital economy, which also presents unprecedented opportunities. Think about it. The smallest company can now seek out customers in the furthest markets, as long as there's digital access. And what it means also is that through the digital platform, they can transact with their business partners, they can coordinate logistics, and they can effect payment systems. This is literally transformative, and it is transforming industries and offering new ways to overcome our constraints and seek out new opportunities. And that is why in the CFE, we've emphasized the importance of enabling our companies to harness digital technologies and platforms. Some companies have already made the move. If I can just give you one example from a very somewhat traditional sector, Hipvan. It's a company in the furniture business, but they have inverted the traditional furniture business model by going online. Customers transact with them over the internet, and then they work through logistics and delivery. And this is a new model for this company, quite different from what we understand to be furniture businesses. So companies are already moving. And similarly, we are seeing good collaborative initiatives from big players and others coming on board. For example, today, just today, Singtel, which is a co-founder of the 99% SME movement, announced a partnership with Lazada to set up an SME e-marketplace. And that will help SMEs tap into a wider online customer base. <clears throat> I can go on and give you many other examples whether it is in advanced manufacturing and internet of things, etc. But the, my key point is this. There are significant opportunities available to us. And our challenge is really ensuring that our companies, especially our small and medium enterprises, are geared up for the longer term so that they can seize these opportunities. And this is especially important if we are to sustain our competitiveness because others around us have also seen this, and they are also adapting. So it is a race, but we think it's a race that we can compete in quite effectively. So a key focus of the government's economic efforts is indeed in how we bring about such transformation, hence the industry transformation maps. And a key mod they are the key modality with three broad areas, as you can see in the slide. The first, to grow top line and scale through support for companies in internationalizing and financing. The second is to stay competitive by supporting capability development, both to innovate and to raise their productivity. And the third, to develop deep skills in our workers. In all of these efforts, the primary focus and beneficiaries are our small and medium-sized enterprises. I want to emphasize that. They are the primary focus and beneficiaries. And that's for good reasons. First, they are a significant part of our economy. They account for about half of our GDP, two-thirds of employment. And if you are really going to effect change and transformation in industry, in the economy, the SMEs are key change agents. They have to accept the reality. They have to embrace the change and be change agents. Secondly, individually, SMEs often lack the scale to make the investments that are necessary to cope with the changes taking place and to benefit fully from the technologies as we are talking about them. Finally, we also believe that SMEs are a key engine of growth for the future in Singapore and integral to the competitiveness of our economic clusters. As they scale, SMEs will create more opportunities and jobs for Singaporeans. So the government is resolute in our commitment to help our SMEs make this transformation successfully. Large companies don't necessarily need this breadth and this depth of support. In fact, it is the small companies that need them. And let me outline five areas in which we are actually delivering this support. First, internationalization. If you are a company taking the first steps towards internationalization, you can tap on IE's market readiness assistance and global company partnerships, et cetera. There's about $400 million in grants. And essentially, the aim is to help our businesses go international. Some are taking tentative steps. Others are a little bit more experienced, but they have to go into newer and more risky markets. And in general, we are trying to help them take that move forward. I want to stress here, government can be an enabler but we cannot make the decision for the company. But once a company makes the decision, the leadership and the people, we can support them in the effort. 
And in this budget specifically, there is the $600 million International Partnership Fund. It is a co-investment effort with firms as they expand overseas. So in other words, beyond loans and financial assistance and grants, the government is prepared to come in through equity as well. So I think this is an important commitment on the part of the government, and we're putting our money where our mouth is, quite literally. Secondly, financing. Government has a suite of loan programs, which will collectively catalyze $5 billion in loans up to 2020. I don't want to get into a laundry list, but it includes, for example, the SME equipment and factory loan, which is for expansion overseas. So you're going overseas, you've done your market studies, you've decided you want to go, but there's CapEx, the scheme helps you. You've got to make the move. The MAS has also recently reviewed regulations that will enhance the ability of finance companies to provide to, financing to SMEs. I mentioned earlier the infrastructure sector, and in this budget, the specific announcement was on the IFS, the International Financial Scheme for Non-Recourse Financing, to help SMEs participate in these opportunities. This scheme is designed to encourage financial institutions to provide non-recourse loans to SMEs once projects move into the post-construction stage so that SMEs can free up their balance sheets to take on new projects. The constraint today is that if I'm a small business going in for a $50, $100 million project in the region, you have to tie up your resources either through personal guarantees or corporate guarantees, and it limits their ability to take on new projects. This scheme is targeted to help our businesses do more and do it in an effective way. Over the next five years, we expect to catalyze $600 million in loans, which will probably correspond to about a $1 billion in infrastructure projects. And I'm talking here about the small businesses, not the big players. Third, on innovation. We want SMEs to create new products and services. That's what they want to do as well, to differentiate themselves in the market. But they are constrained by resources that are available. And I think several members talked about this earlier. So we have a range of schemes. One is to help SMEs commercialize intellectual property through our network of centers of innovation. And a substantial amount of funding has been committed, about 100 million for this. It's to help them build up their innovation capabilities. We also have the secondment of our public sector researchers to our SMEs. They go there, they help them come up with their R&D blueprint, and they also, in many cases, end up joining the SME sometimes to the chagrin of the research center's director. But in general, we are supportive of this because it is an important productive flow of talent between the public and the private sector. And in this budget, there were two specific ideas which have been mooted and pushed out. One is ASTAR's Tech Access Initiative. Basically, it's to help SMEs access uh, the more costly specialized equipment and to also get training and advice. In other words, these may be in our research institutes, and SMEs cannot afford to have it on their own, but they can go in there and use it under certain arrangements. And the Head Start program, where ASTAR allows SMEs to enjoy royalty-free and exclusive IP licenses for up to date, it was up to recently, it was 18 months, but with this budget, it has now gone to 36 months. And the fourth point is on capability development. The SMEs can tap on this sort of grants, capability development grants, for larger scale projects. So whether it's automation, so there's automation support, and I think members are familiar with the scheme that was introduced last year. There's also the innovation and capability vouchers. And importantly, point I want to stress is what we have is called the Partnerships for Capability Transformation. This is where SMEs collaborate with big companies in order to develop new capabilities. This is key because many of our SMEs are an integral part of a cluster. They work with a core company, a big player, international, local, or foreign. And their capabilities, the SMEs' capabilities, reinforces the competitiveness of the, of the cluster as a whole and its sustainability in our environment. And of course, many members have talked about the Go Digital program. I don't propose to elaborate on it other than to observe that this is, again, a key plank. Big companies don't need a Go Digital program. It's the SMEs that need it, and that's why we're doing it. And in total, we have about $1.5 billion of grant support for such capability development of SMEs. And finally, a word on skills. 
We are making significant investment in developing skills of our people. Members are very familiar with this through Skills Future, and they, SMEs can tap on this, whether it's Skills Future initiatives like the SME Talent Program, Skills Future Mentor Scheme, and the Skills Future Earn and Learn Program. So I've taken you on a tour of the kind of things that we are doing with our companies. And sometimes the criticism is, oh, it's all too complicated and so much. Not so much that there's too little, but there's too much and it's too variegated. So even on that score, our agencies have worked on how we can make government support more accessible to SMEs. So they've got a business grants portal, SME digital technology hub, and a new IP master agreement. But let me cut to the chase. If you're an SME, you have a need in these areas, go to an SME center or go to one of the economic agencies. There is no wrong door. They will help you navigate and sort it out. That's a back-end issue. The key point is we have this plethora of support. So I'm surprised when uh, Mr. Leon Pereira, I think earlier, said that we have missed an opportunity to strengthen local enterprises. I've just given you a complete and this is not an exhaustive list of the various initiatives that we have undertaken. So how is it a missed opportunity? And perhaps the key point he is trying to make is that government should get into the business of picking more winners, because I think he described it as a bold initiative. Go in there, back a company. If it fails or doesn't meet up the expectations, pull out. It's an interesting idea, but Mr. Pereira has omitted important details and how he would execute this and why government would be the right party to do this. Because if government backs a company, it goes wherever in whatever initiative, and then the initiative goes south, and then government decides that it's going to withdraw the support, I think we can anticipate the kind of debate we would have, and indeed the kind of questions that Mr. Leon Pereira will then pose on why did you do it in this way? Why did you waste your funds here, or why did you withdraw your support? So, I think we have to have a sense of perspective and balance. Government is an important enabler. Government is taking a view on certain industries and directions that we want to go. But fundamentally, what we are trying to say is this. You are in an inherently more uncertain environment. Therefore, the emphasis on the broad range of capabilities that I've outlined and this broad scheme of measures that we have are going to be the key platform to raise industries as a whole. Sure, the companies that are prepared to move further and go faster will be better, will receive more support. But that does not mean that we are picking winners. The winners are picking themselves and adapting to our schemes. And I want to emphasize that the impact of such schemes is really significantly amplified when we can get a collaborative effort going. And that is why we have stressed the role of trade associations and chambers. We do not want to substitute business judgment or trade association and chambers assessment of market conditions with bureaucratic views. We want it to be a complementary exercise. So one example I want to just share with members is the logistics industry. Container Depot Association, probably not something that many of you are familiar with, but they have been involved in a major effort in terms of launching electronic container track trucking system, container trucking system, and they want to track the movement of their trucks, and it's going to enhance their supply chain and how they introduce efficiencies in the way they deploy their fleet and so on. Now, this is an initiative that the CDAs came up with. They worked with Spring, and they've got this executed. And we want to see more of this because they understand the need. Their members tell them what their issues are. We can appreciate that there won't be enough resources, but that's where we come in and we complement. Similarly, Singapore Logistics Association has made initiatives in terms of going into new markets overseas and how they can help smaller businesses do that, and also in the training of our workers. So I hope members will agree with me that there is actually no lack of government resolve or resources that are available to support our companies, especially our SMEs make the transformation. But I know that there is a view, and I think many of us have echoed that sentiment here, that, well, but the current reality is the issue. We have challenges because of the cost and the pain and so on. And the reality also is that the economic situation is variegated. 
you have sectors like electronics that grew at 15% last year. You have a sector like transport and storage that grew by 2.3% last year. You have a sector like marine and offshore engineering that has contracted for nine successive quarters. How do you come up with a program that is supposed to help SMEs in all of these beyond the measures that we have already undertaken? So these variations are there because the different sectors face diverse cyclical and structural challenges. For example, lower oil prices, and some might argue that this might be a permanent shift, has changed the demand patterns for marine and offshore industry. It doesn't mean that they cannot do business, but they may have to adapt and also look at new opportunities. The retail industry is going through a major change because of disruptive technology, and in particular e-commerce. In fact, the adoption of e-commerce in Singapore is at a lower rate compared to many markets around the world. So if anything, the challenge is going to get greater, not lesser. And it would really be quite futile for us to argue that we should resist such an overwhelming system level change, which in fact, in aggregate, will bring benefit to consumers, to businesses that respond to it and adapt to it, and to the economy as a whole. Having said that, I think we are very clear that we recognize that there are immediate challenges that our SMEs are facing, and we will continue to provide certain forms of short-term relief where they are necessary and through system, the, the system of sort of broad-based support that we have built up over the years. So one example is the wage credit, the special employment credit, and the extension of the additional SEC in this budget till end of 2019. Collectively, this is about $1 billion in cash payouts to businesses in March this year. It's no mean sum. It is a significant outlay from the government to alleviate some of the cost pressure on our businesses. Also, in terms of liquidity, we have introduced SME working capital loans in 2016, which has basically catalyzed about $700 million in loans to about 4,300 SMEs. And then if you go beyond that and you look at the, the broader pattern, I think there was some reference to rental and other business costs. I know that this is an area of concern. It comes up in many of our industry engagement exercises. But the reality also is that industrial, retail, and office rentals have all fallen. And they fell in 2016 as well. And we, on our part, will continue to maintain a steady pipeline of industrial land and, sp and space to ensure that there's competitive pressure in the market and rentals remain affordable. So let me pull it together and say we have not introduced further broad-based measures because they're not quite warranted and probably not even appropriate for the circumstances that we are in. But we have sustained what we already do, in some cases extended them, and at the same time put in place additional customized support for specific industries because of the circumstances that are quite divergent. And we will continue, as many government leaders have said, we will continue to track the situation closely and intervene where necessary. So if I can just give you an example, marine and offshore engineering sector, in last December, we introduced the bridging loans and international finance scheme. It's not a panacea. It's not going to prevent consolidation, which will occur to some extent in the industry. But what it will do is help address some of the liquidity issues that some of the strong companies are facing and potentially also help them get financing for expansion when they go for new projects overseas because there was a general tightening for financing in the sector. Another example is in the construction industry. It has been weighed down by the property market slowdown and economic uncertainties, but we are bringing forward $700 million of public sector infrastructure projects which will start in FY17 and 18. These measures are an illustration of the government responding with a more targeted response and support for SMEs and other businesses. And it is a complement to the broad-based measures we already have in place in response to the varied needs in the economy. And importantly, it is one aspect, even as we look at the longer-term challenge and how we need to gear up for that. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I can summarize, we have significant opportunities before us. 
But to seize them, we have to invest in the capabilities of our economy, of our people, and our enterprises, and especially so with our SMEs. The most durable solution really lies in moving up the value chain, innovating, offering products and services that others are not offering, and adopting methods and techniques that will allow us to close some of the big gaps in productivity that we see when compared to international best practice. As for the government, we are resolute in our support through broad-based and targeted programs to help our SMEs make the transition successful. We do not engage in the art, or perhaps Mr. Pereira thinks it's a science of picking winners, but we will support companies that are prepared to make these important transitions because they see the benefit and they're prepared to take the important steps to move the organization. And in all of these efforts, the SMEs will be our central focus. So ultimately, creating a vibrant, competitive industry with strong capabilities is the surest way of ensuring success of all our businesses, including the SMEs. And so we look forward to working closely with the trade associations and chambers and the unions to ensure that we have a diverse enterprise ecosystem from startups to SMEs to large local enterprises to multinationals. We have a thriving SME community and an economy that is rich with opportunities. Thank you, Deputy Speaker.